Generally, first contact goes one of two ways. Either the species is receptive and friendly, diplomatic talks begin and alliances formed. Or they take one look at you and decide you deserve to be slaves that belong to them. It's a 50-50 chance of either, of course, though it tends to lean more towards the former rather than the latter. Not so with species 903829AC, a species that nobody in the galaxy has a name for because this species simply ignores everyone else around them. And with good reason. Species 903829AC is massive, clocking in on average half the size of Terra's moon, and were otherworldly in the sense that many would call them eldritch horrors beyond all comprehension, and certainly not of this universe. The only thing anyone can truly comprehend about them is their aesthetic. Everything, be it starships or terrestrial structures, are a fusion of flowing organic lines and harsh synthetic precision. As for everything else, their language was mostly indecipherable, as it caused pretty much everyone who heard it to bleed from the ears. Their written language did the same just from the eyes, and trying to psychically link with them was liable to make your head explode. Literally. Beyond that, though, they didn't bother anyone. They stuck to their region of space, did their thing, and kept out of the way. Eventually, it just became common practice to not even register their presence, just as they did not register ours, for most of the species in the galaxy were about the size of ants, and thus always underfoot. However, this did not deter humanity, who realized that everyone else had given up on trying to be diplomatic with species 903829AC. As a result, humanity felt it was their duty to be neighborly, as they put it. One can assure how well that went. The first few missions ended in several messy ways. The first was an attempt at psychic connection. Humanity, of course, not heeding our warnings that such a thing was lethal. They believed we were trying for too big of a connection, and that starting out small was the way to go. The cleaning bots spent four days scraping brain matter and bits of skull off the walls, floor and ceiling. The next mission was far less lethal but would result in the diplomat needing to retire, as they could no longer hear nor see, thanks to getting a good long look at the written language in its barely translated form, while also listening to a member of species 903829AC we had managed to make contact with. After that, humanity shelved the idea for a time, working on various countermeasures that would hopefully ensure the survivability of their diplomats and allow them to return home uninjured and with good news. It took twenty years and many failed attempts to do so, till they announced they were ready to try again. This time they announced it with such confidence that we simply had to be there to watch, and so I was sent along to observe. After all, if the humans managed to be successful, then that meant we could be as well. Freesworm is my name, and I am a member of the Tragen Coalition. I serve as the ambassador for my species, and for the past week as an observer for the Federation aboard the DSV Blind Luck, a human diplomatic vessel and widely considered one of their best. It was a fascinating experience, to say the least. I had never spent any amount of time on a ship that was a majority human, so the differences in cultures were far more clear to me than usual. Still, I found the time spent aboard the ship to be highly informative. I'd even made a few friends during the trip, which was not all that normal for me, I'm afraid to admit. I've always been a bit closed off to others, ironic considering my choice of profession. Yet, for all my flaws when it comes to personal relations, I'm quite capable of holding lengthy conversations with strangers, especially if said conversations involve diplomatic relations. That said, I had seemingly annoyed the universe and never managed to get a word in with the human ambassador, one Blake Atkinson, who was making this journey with his wife. The two were apparently inseparable, and so she went everywhere with him. As a result, when he wasn't working and not to be disturbed, he was in his quarters with his wife, also not to be disturbed. I would always catch a glimpse of him in a corridor or the mess hall. 
but something always managed to get in my way. Like extreme percussive maintenance conducted by a very aggravated engineer, for example. Needless to say, that was the one black spot on this journey. But I suppose I shall just have to live with it. Today would be different, however. I could feel it in my tentacles. Today, history would be made, I was sure of it. The day began as usual. I rose from my little pond in my quarters, ensured the hydration apparatus was firmly attached to a special belt, slipped into my robes, donned the ceremonial ink, and went to find something to eat. My meal was the same as it had been every other morning, a delicacy that had been overstocked just for me, not at my request, though. Just humans attempting to please by getting too much of something I would enjoy. I found it endearing. Either way, I thrummed happily as I slurped down a bowl full of centauri eels. And that's where my morning routine suddenly deviated. Sir, you've been requested in the medwing when you've finished breakfast. An ensign said, the young man looking dashing in his uniform. Even though this was a diplomatic vessel, it was staffed by human naval personnel in the event they encountered hostile species. I nodded, turning an accepting pastel shade of pink. My thanks. Please inform them that I shall be along shortly. About... I paused and peered down at what was left of my meal. Five minutes, I calculate. The ensign nodded with a soft smile and turned to do as I had asked, leaving me to the rest of my meal. I pondered the reasoning behind calling me to the medical bay. I was up to date on all my inoculations against Terran illnesses. Perhaps they just wanted to make sure I was in good health before the big day. Yes, that seemed quite prudent to me. Still, I was left curious as my tendrils conveyed me down the hall, the hem of my robes dragging along the floor with small devices within the fabric to clean up my natural secretions. We Tragin had learned quickly that human cleaning cast members get rather irritated when they have to clean up our goo. Something about it being as sticky as glue. Regardless, we did not wish to make their lives more difficult, nor leave behind a mess. Entering the stark white space that was the medical bay, I was immediately confronted with the smell of sterility, something else humans took rather seriously. Then again, everyone else did too when it came to medical practices. I was directed over to a bench built for my species by a kind nurse and waited my turn. During this wait I observed some strange test being conducted upon the other non-human members of the crew and those like me who were here to observe. Then it was my turn, and a tired-looking yet still energetic doctor appeared before me, pushing a cart with all manner of strange contraption upon it. "'Good morning, Ambassador. I trust you had a good breakfast?' the doctor said in pleasant manner. "'Indeed, it was most delicious.' I nodded and the doctor smiled before clearing his throat. Excellent. Now I suspect you have some questions about what you're doing here today. Rest assured it won't take too long, nor hopefully bar you from today's proceedings. I just need to run a series of tests, and then you'll be free to go. Sound good? Yes, though I am curious about these tests. Wonderful. Please put these on. The doctor interrupted me by handing me what appeared to be a pair of glasses meant for my gelatinous head, as well as some kind of ear protection along the same vein of construction as the glasses. In my startled state, I did as he asked, slipping both on and wondering just why I had to do this. Doctor, I don't underst— I began, just before he held up a somewhat large piece of stiff paper with perfectly understandable writing on it. Okay. Can you tell me what this says? he asked, and I hummed in mild discontent, but did as he asked anyways. Flipples the cat ran away from a spat. Flipples the cat jumped over the moon and slid down a dune. I frowned softly, as much as my face would allow. What does that even mean? I asked. Yet the doctor looked incredibly happy by what I'd said, and set the piece of paper down before pushing a button on a device next to it. 
From the device came a sweet voice that sang to me, California girls, we're unforgettable, Daisy Dukes, bikinis on top. The doctor looked expectant and I looked at him in confusion. I do not understand, doctor, just what are Daisy Dukes, I asked, and there was a series of muffled snorts from the other human medical staff, the doctor himself barely able to hold back a smile. Not important, but since you were able to ask that question, that means you've passed both tests with flying colours. Congratulations. You're free to go. Oh, though I do ask that you keep those on you from here on out. At all times, please. One. Captain's orders, he said, and pushed the cart away to the next person he was meant to see. I left the medical bay still wearing the odd devices I had been given, my mind lost in a sea of confusion that I simply could not navigate. I knew I should be a bit angry by how the doctor had talked to me, but he was clearly busy and had many other people to see in a presumably short amount of time, so perhaps I should be more understanding. The rest of the day was a bit of a blur, but it was rudely interrupted by a notification that it was time for things to get underway and that I should report to the hangar for a quick trip via shuttle. Now, that was odd. Why would we have to get into a shuttle? I would soon find out as we all stepped aboard the large shuttle meant for large groups such as ours and found myself sitting across from the human diplomat that I had been meaning to talk to ever since this trip started. Excuse me, Mr. Atkinson, but can we talk for a minute? I asked, and the man looked up, adjusting a metal box on his lap as he did so. Sure. Ambassador Vriesworm, what would you like to talk about? He asked, sounding tired but more than willing to engage me in conversation. Well, I was hoping to learn more about Yo. I started to say, just as the internal comms kicked on. Attention all hands! We're beginning landing procedures with the alien vessel. ETA 20 seconds, the pilot said, and I grumbled. The universe must be playing some cruel joke on me. I was about to continue voicing my question, but Ambassador Atkinson's aides stole his attention. As a result, I compressed my form with a bubbling grumble of discontent, murmuring in a dialect I knew the translation software would not understand. We all felt the gentle jolt of the shuttle landing, the plain white lights of the interior shifting to soft red then green, as the airlock seals were broken and the pressures were equalized. Immediately the humidity rose by a considerable degree, which was fine for me. It felt like I was back home, actually, but the humans did not find joy in this, as they all groaned and some even removed a few layers of clothing, ensuring they remained professional but allowing their skin to breathe better at the same time. One by one we all filed off the shuttle and marvelled at being here aboard a ship that belonged to species 903829AC. It was a cavernous hangar, as to be expected considering the size of the builders. The roof was covered in rack after rack of what were mostly likely starfighters, but to us they were more the size of a small corvette. No doubt they were just as fast and manoeuvrable as a starfighter, though. But we couldn't be sure. We'd never seen species 903829AC in battle. Nobody dared test their strength against them after all. We were just starting to look around for some sort of escort when means of conveyance materialized before us, rather literally, the contraption being teleported to a spot about 12 feet away. It looked like a pill, complete with little windows. This we knew about. The last diplomats had used something similar during their last attempts to reach the meeting area. So we boarded it without much hesitation and got comfortable. The pod sealed and started to move on its own without any sort of pilot at the helm. Fairly soon we were zipping along through the hangar and then straight for a wall. Several of the more ignorant of us began to whimper or panic, but those of us who knew what was going to happen simply tensed up slightly. Just before impact, the wall opened a bit, presenting us with a light show that sucked us into it and shot us at incredible speeds through the massive ship. 
Thankfully, we couldn't feel the acceleration, nor the deceleration either, as we stopped about a minute later, deep within the bowels of the ship. Disembarking, we found ourselves in a very large room, one with a table at our height, thankfully, and plenty of seats arranged around the periphery for those of us who were just here to observe the proceedings. I and the others got settled, while Ambassador Atkinson sat himself down at the table and placed the metal box off to one side and a suitcase before him. He conversed quietly with his aides, and they too set their own suitcases down on the table. They spent the next five minutes swapping papers around or whispering to one another before the large door opposite them opened and in stepped Species 903829AC. It towered over us all. Each breath it took was near deafening, but as we stared up at the massive form, it began to shrink, the sound utterly alien and quite unnerving. It sounded like wet slurping as it grew smaller and smaller, till it was about the same height as the human ambassador. Speaking of, with a nod from Atkinson, he and his aides produced what appeared to be a small black pill and popped them into their mouths, swallowing as quietly as they could with a soft grimace. They waited a moment before Atkinson stood and held out a hand to the alien that had come to talk with us. On behalf of Terra and her colonies and the Galactic Federation who is in attendance this day, we bid you greetings and overtures of friendship. He spoke calmly, clearly and presumably loud enough for the alien to hear him easily. The alien, an ever-shifting mass of oil like darkness and flesh with a set of eight glowing eyes and tendrils sprouting from behind them, peered down at his hand before gently grasping it. We hope this does not end like the other times. The being said, and everyone gasped. Nobody was in extreme pain, nobody was bleeding from the ears or ear equivalents. Even the alien speaker seemed surprised by this. Suddenly the tests that had been conducted made sense to me, and I felt silly for being so annoyed by them. Atkinson only smiled and gave the hand he held a firm shake before he sat down. Well, I think it's safe to say so far, so good. Now, to business. And so talks began. It was astonishing to think we could now safely converse with this species and they seemed even more surprised by it all. Lexicons were exchanged, information freely given, and soon we had several agreements in place to facilitate trade and other matters. We learned that they called themselves Shahil, and we were delighted to learn this, as it meant we could do away with that dreadful generic designation we'd given them. Ten hours later we had reached the end of the talks, and it was clear everyone was preparing to leave and converse with their respective governments, when the Shihil representative, called Ngethis, raised their hand. Before we bid temporary farewell, we wish to provide you with a gift, one just for you. They turned and produced what appeared to be a necklace of some kind, one that had been sized just for a human neck. Dangling from it was a pendant with what appeared to be several galaxies swirling within, and it was presented carefully to Atkinson, who took it with clear surprise written on his face. I... thank you. I don't know what to say, except I didn't know we were going to exchange gifts, otherwise I would have brought something, he said, slipping the necklace over his head and tucking it slightly into his jacket. You may provide a gift at your leisure... It is merely our custom and we understand why you do not present one now. Ngathis said, Atkinson nodding, before his eyes alighted on the metal box he'd brought. A small smile crept over his face and he carefully opened, a smell wafting through the room that everyone could register, though the humans seemed unperturbed by it. Well, how about this? A gift from me and later one from my people as a whole. I'd hate to leave here without giving something back, he said, producing two square items made out of bread, it seemed. The wife tends to overproduce my lunches, can never finish it all, and so it tends to go to waste. But not this time, I hope. 
Could I perhaps interest you in a nice peanut butter and jelly sandwich and other assorted food items? We all watched, curious to see the response from Nethys, who leaned in close and sniffed the offered food item. This is... human food? They asked, and Atkinson nodded. It sure is, one that stood the test of time as well, he affirmed, and Nethys gingerly took the sandwich, examining it closely. Atkinson, though, raised his like he was giving a toast, grinning broadly. Two new friends, he proclaimed, and took a hearty bite from the sandwich. Nethys blinked all eight eyes in sequence, then carefully took a bite of their own before a content-pleased rumble escaped them. When at last they swallowed, they spoke a word that made everyone, especially the humans, breathe a sigh of relief. Delicious. I learned later that the items I and everyone else were wearing had protected us from the harmful effects of auditory and visual exposure to the shihil, and that the pills the humans had taken did the same. Apparently, they had only managed to tailor the pills to the human genome, hence why none of us had gotten any. It was a fascinating thing to learn. Human ingenuity and stubbornness had once again solved a massive problem in the galaxy, and for that, we would always be indebted to them. Twenty years later, and the giving of gifts is still practiced when dealing with any shihil, and just about every species in the galaxy has learned how to prepare a peanut butter and jelly sandwich to give away. And that is how the greatest act of diplomacy had been conducted, a new friendship formed with a simple gift. A gift of a sandwich.